right, so very briefly, let me introduce our special speaker for, for this session. Uh, we have only 45 minutes, so I will try to be very brief. Uh, so, since 2019, he's the president of the ISTQB. Uh, very rich experience in, in testing, he's an author of books, publications, uh, working on uh, certifications, existing and new ones, and obviously speaker on the numerous international conferences. So, let me welcome Oliver Denon. Good afternoon. <laughs> A couple of minutes ago, I lost my job. But I'm pretty sure that all together and through this presentation, we will find it back and we will come to a happy end. This presentation is about jobs, but it's more about value, definitely. And why am I interested in value? Because this is something that we promise our customers, our clients, everyone, all the time. And especially in these times where agility with a very, very good marketing gimmick said, we will deliver value faster. You heard that one, right? But basically speaking, okay, that's fine. But what is value exactly? Where do we come to that notion of value and what is really valuable? And thanks to this uh, wonderful organization, I will change my slides a little bit and my talk a little bit. This was one of the examples to show me that value is something that is depending on the context. And yesterday I've been offered that little boy. You know, I hope it's a boy. I think it is. It is. That little boy is probably, yeah, you can buy it somewhere and the retail value is I would say a couple of euros. I don't know and I don't want to know. This is a gift, okay? But to me, this little boy is worth much more. This little boy is reminding me that I'm talking in a fantastic conference, that I have the freedom to travel and see the people back, you know, straight into the eyes, not online conference, but a real conference with real people, having a drink with good friends, and changing views about testing, my passion, with loads of experts and, and, and people, enjoying Poland. This is priceless. The example in the slide is exactly in the same direction. If you buy a teddy bear for your little one, girl or boy, who cares? It's probably 10 euro or 10 dollar or whatever in Zloty. But if that little one is losing that teddy bear somewhere in the big shopping mall next door, this is the friend of a lifetime. This is the confidant. This is the plush toy where all the secrets are shared. This is what the little one is losing. It's not $10, it's not 10 euro, it's priceless. This is that notion of value, you know? You have the real value and you have the perceived value. What do you think it's worth for you? And the same goes for our product and services for our customers, by the way. You need to have another example to be convinced. Okay, I want to drink a bottle of Coke. Well, by the way, I don't like soda, but okay, I took the example. Whatever you are in the world, depending on the context, this bottle of soda will cost a different price, will have a different value. And you won't even complain if you buy that higher price if you go to a disco and drink a Coca-Cola, while you perfectly know that the value in the end of the production chain is probably 10 times less. And I can even challenge it a little bit more and say, okay, if the bottle is opened, would you still buy it? Uh, has it still got some value for you? Most of you would probably say, no, I would never touch that. Oh, how about if you're starving in the desert and you find this bottle of cola? It might save your life. You see the perspective. And, oh, by the way, 20 years ago, the retail price of Coca-Cola was less because they wanted to encourage you to drink more. So basically speaking, they lowered the price. Interesting, ain't it? So let's look about value and, and what exactly we do deliver and why we deliver it that way. And one way to discover value and to approach value is to try to capture it within a system. 
And the system might be requirements. Okay? Oh, requirements that will work today in the agile world. That would be user story, that would be epics, that would be themes, that would be features, that would be whatever you like. I don't mind. It's just a way to capture what the customer wants. What is valuable to them? And what is valuable to one of customer is not valuable for all. There's a way to capture value and to capture requirements or whatever you call them. It's called jobs. This is what we're talking about this morning or early afternoon. It's about job. And a job is described that way. You have who. Who is the job taker? The job taker, that is the person who is doing the action, who is doing the job. And it can differ a lot from the one who buy it. You can be a user of an application, but this is the procurement, the purchase guys, who are, you know, buying the system, buying the, the, the piece of software. These are different people. And these different people have different objectives. As a user, I want it to be usable. I want to be able to do my job with the software or, or service or whatever. As a buyer, I want it to be as cheap as possible, having the best return on investment for my company. And even on top of that, there might be people approving, approvers. These are the people who say to the buyer, yeah, okay, I agree with the negotiation you've made, and this is the right price for the job. The second component is what? What is the job? And we'll come to that. Oh, by the way, I found my job back, so thank you very much for those who were worrying about me. I'm now back on track. And this job is delivering the talk to Tesquares. This is my job. How is the process? How I'm going to do the job? And then I have some sort of contextual when, that's this morning, why, what is the need. So basically speaking, there are some job principles. Jobs, as you see, as you've seen on the previous slide, maybe I will switch to the previous slide again. Jobs are pieces of work that you need to deliver, and you will see that they are very, very atomic. There are principles behind jobs, and the principle is that people use your products and services to do their jobs. They have some task. You can replace the name job by task. You have something to do, something atomic, something that you need to deliver. This is your job. And to do your job properly, you will use products or services. But that's only to do your job. This is not to please me, this is not to please your supplier, this is not because you want to use a technology or something. It is totally independent from that. You just have something to do and you will use the piece of software or the service to do it. Full stop. This is a game changer because I hear a lot of engineers just saying, hey, this is the brand new technology, it uses AI, it uses this or that, and this is Java on the rail with that script or I don't know what kind of you know, gibberish talk they can use. Engineers are terrible, but the users don't care. I don't care about Java, Ruby, whatever, uh, Selenium, or whatever you have. I just want to do my task. And this is why we are delivering pieces of, of, of software or services to these guys. Jobs, the way they are described, that's a little bit of methodology now. Jobs are timeless. The same job can be described 50 years later or 20 years ago. This is the same. They are totally technology agnostic. I don't care about the technology. People are looking to do their job in a more effective and efficient way. So they want to deliver their job faster and better. And if you analyze the stuff, there is a room for innovation. We'll come to that later in the presentation. It is something that is transverse, that is applicable to the entire organization. And it has a meaning, some understanding, and a clear beginning, and a clear end. Deliver a talk to Tess Juarez. It has a beginning, 
It was five, ten minutes ago, and it will have an end. Fortunately for you, the ones you get no lunch today. And I think that you will not be happy with me. How do you define a job? This is the grandma story. Sorry, the grandma story. A job is something that is starting with a verb, having an object, and a clarification. That is some kind of very, very basic way of talking. Deliver, talk, do those words. Easy. But it captures the real fundamental, the real element, the real essence of it. For example, find plane ticket to LA. As you see, I didn't say via internet operator, or quickly, or the cheapest ticket, whatever. The main job is something that is very atomic. We will come to these elements later. They will clarify the job a little bit later, but basically the real task, the real fundamental task, is described in these three little words. Okay. This is taken from an individual, individual perspective. Some sort of issue with this, okay? It starts with a verb. It's stable over time. As I said, this is stable over time. It can be the same job 20 years ago. And I will give you an example where people were confused about job. And because they confused job, this company nearly went bankrupt. We'll come to that later. And sometimes it requires to be clarified. No technology, nothing about method approach, nothing about preference or choice. This will come eventually, but not now. And, of course, like for requirements or whatever, there's neither or or and or whatever. Uh, if you have that, that means that you have two jobs. Like user stories, epics, themes, whatever. Jobs can be hierarchized, and this is the same for requirements in the old days. Okay? You have requirements that are high-level requirements, and you have low-level requirements. Jobs are the same. Let me give you an example. I walk somewhere down a big construction that is ongoing, and I see a mason. And the mason is just putting bricks, brick layers, you know, one on top of the other. And I just ask the guy, what are you doing? And the guy tells me, I'm a mason. I'm building a wall. Okay, that's his job. Then I go a little bit further and talk to somebody else, and that somebody else is kind of a assistant architect or something, and I, I, I ask the same question. And the answer is, we are building a cloister. Okay, fine. Then I go a little bit further and I ask to the architect in chief, and the architect in chief says, okay, we are building a cathedral, and this cloister is part of a cathedral, and the wall is part of the cloister. And then I go to the uh, bishop and say, what are you doing? We are sustaining faith. We are showing that God is there with us, and that we are building the cathedral. So, you see that these jobs can be nested and can have different levels of granularity. Okay. These jobs can be linked one to another. Okay. So, for instance, oh, by the way, the main job, this is French, because previous presentation was in Polish, so I take my revenge, this is French. It means <laughs> increase. My retreat, uh, my retreat fund, my pension fund, okay? And basically speaking, it's also linked to different components. Again, remember the story about a little girl losing her teddy bear or me losing this uh, beautiful gift from, from Tessoir, is this memory, this piece of memory? Well, there are some components in the job that are about the same. There is some kind of empathy confidence and, and, and some uh, social confidence. So I want to, if, if I spare my, for, for my retirement, uh, I want to appear to the outside world as somebody who is competent, who is taking care of his future, blah, blah, blah. And for myself, I want to reassure myself and say, well, I'm, when I'm growing on, when I really lose my job, 
then all is in control because I have some money aside and I can still have a decent living after all. Okay? So you see that a job has some confidence. Jobs are linked to needs. Okay? When you're in need, one of the uh, possible uh, needs that I would have is well, the job, get promoted. My job is to get promoted. I want to earn more money. Speaks to you, I suppose. Okay? And then I need to earn more money, but I need to earn more money as fast as possible. You know? So, and I want to make sure that I will be the one who gets more money. So if there is a promotion, I want to maximize the, my chances to get a promotion, and I want to maximize the chance as fast as possible, because I don't need money in 20 years, and I don't want to be promoted in 20 years, it's too long. Life is too short. So you see how it articulates. Need, what is it a need? It's an individual requirement to complete the job. It's more or less comparable to a goal, and if you're familiar with the IRET methodology or the design thinking methodology, it's a little bit different uh, because there it is more asking for a solution as, as the definition. A need is made of several components. A certain direction of change, maximize. Some metrics, probability. Some object to get an approval, certification. Um, uh, clarification, sorry, of my boss. Okay? So you see that there are different components that you can use to clarify the job, clarify the requirement. So, maximize the probability to get the approval of my boss to attend the conference. And there are some circumstances. And the circumstances are the things that might influence what is on top, what is above. It's more difficult, of course, to get the approval to go for a conference when there's no money in the company and they want to reduce costs because today's situation. Um, it is more difficult for me to go for a second conference because I got a ticket this year to go for a, another one. And it might be uh, more difficult for me to get a ticket, or easier for me to get a ticket, because this is a famous conference, so it's supposed to be expensive, or it's supposed to be uh, yeah, loads of people, or less interesting, or more interesting, depending. One of the biggest difficulties that we have in finding the good requirements, and clarifying the good requirements, and ultimately, seeking for value and defining value, is that sometimes we totally confuse the jobs and we totally don't understand what the real value is all about. And we need to check this out. Do you know this one? Have you ever seen this piece of uh, art? This is a juicer. And this juicer is designed by Philip Stark, who is a very well-known designer all over the world, he designed many, many objects, he's a very renowned guy, okay? This piece of crap, sorry to say, oh, I shouldn't say that. Um, this piece of art costs a lot of money, actually. It's about 150 euros, so you multiply by 4.5 to get uh, the stuff, or 4.7 to get the stuff in, 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 in Zloty, okay? There's even golden plated ones, okay? And they're even words, well, more expensive, of course, you can imagine. This is a limited edition. And they're even worse because you can't even use it because the, the lemon juice is attacking some sort. Well, the gold is not attacked by uh, acid, but still, it doesn't work fine. Uh, this, as a juicer, is very nice if you invite a couple of friends and you want to know to show off. Oh, look, I have to fill this start. It's there, it's very well on the shelf. Very nice piece of art. But if you want to use it, don't, do, don't use it in the morning, yeah, especially if you're in a hurry. Yeah? Buy a new one, because otherwise you have the juice all over the place and you get nothing in your glass. <laughs> and you know what Philip Stark said about it? He, he, he designed that stuff. I, I read the story. It's, it's funny, he was in a restaurant somewhere in Italy and he just used a napkin and, and, and drew that. Oh, I don't 
was fine because he was contacted by uh, Alessi, this is an Alessi uh, designer. Uh, and basically, he, he just said, after all, and I don't know if he said that as an excuse or if he, he realized that that's from the beginning, but this is to start a conversation. This is not to juice lemons. Or to start a conversation, it does the job perfectly. If this is the added value, you got it. If you want to juice, I might have. Okay? Another example where, where people confuse jobs. And this is a sad story. This is about Kodak. Well, you probably know Kodak, this uh, photograph company, whatever. They thought, at a certain moment in time, they were the market leaders in terms of, you know, these, these uh, film, the, the stuff that you put in the uh, cameras. Long ago, I know that you're long people, I'm an old guy, so I, I still had to put this stuff into the camera and blah, blah, blah. Today, you just uh, have a chip or whatever, and it works perfectly. But at this time, these guys were still using that sort of device, and they were the market leader. There was absolutely nobody else that was better than them on this market. And they thought that because they were the market leader, this stuff will last forever and ever after. But they completely confused the job. The job for you and me or everyone that is taking a picture, what is it? Is it I want to take a picture? Is it I want to have the best film support in the world or whatever? The real stuff is I want to capture the moment. I want to grab the memory. And I don't care whether it's on the paper, whether it's on a hard drive, whether it's done with my uh, cell phone. Uh, tomorrow it might just be a kind of uh, IoT device that we uh, uh, wear around the ear and, and, and we just take the picture like this. Or I don't know, it might be tridimensional. The job is I want to capture the moment, I want to get the memory. And because of that they refused to invest in the new technologies and in the new stuff that were going on and they ran out of business. As simple as that. And you can perfectly run out of business with your customers or clients if you don't really understand their job, what is valuable to them, what they want to achieve with what you deliver. If you miss that point that is absolutely essential, and it's the very beginning, yeah? it's the, really the beginning of everything, and it's, you, you can't shift more left. If you don't grab them, you are going to develop with expensive technologies and all kind of, you know, buzzwords, whatever, something that they will never use or want to use. Okay. When you want to look for value and, and, and seeking that, uh, you need to talk with the customer, with the, the people who take the job, you know. You need to get as less bias as possible. A little bit like the usability interviews. I'm not explaining. I'm not going to explain to you. If you want to hear more about it, I'll uh, uh, just go to the ISTQB syllabi about usability. But it's conducting the interview, asking what people are trying to achieve with the service or product, whatever. Understand the jobs and the related jobs, the connecting jobs uh, with, with, with the main job. Understand the process. Understand the need and the circumstances. So try to figure out their journey, their their round trip as users. Okay. Now, you need to discuss with real jobbers. The, one of the biggest problems that we are facing today, whether it is testers or whether they are developers, is to find the real customer, the real user, the end user. And with agility, we say, oh, we have a PO, and the PO understands everything, and then the PO can uh, describe everything. True, but not always. Okay. So try to limit as much as possible the biases. Try to limit all the intermediates or all the in-betweens. You know? Try to come back to the core value and this is why I like uh, jobs to be done because it's a very, very simple way of expressing value. How do you propose value? Well, proposing value is try to find what is not really well addressed in your current piece of software or service. Listing, and, and how you do that? Well, either you have a direct contact with your customers, which is the best, or you have personas that are modelizing, that are kind of fake users, but at least you have them in mind and at least you modelize your users some sort of way so that you deliver the product or service to them. 
You can compare with competition, definitely. And find your differentiator. And defining, we'll come to that quite quickly, uh, a value proposal. Bringing value, it's listing what you don't deliver or what you do, do not deliver right or not enough. Okay? You state that, and how do you discover that, that, that stuff? Very easily by asking your users. And one of the simplest ways to discover where you're good and where you're bad is to ask them in that form. For me, the job or the need X, Y, Z is important and I'm happy. That's very easy. You just ask them on the main aspects of your service, on the main aspect of your product, are you happy? And what is it that you want to achieve with that? Is it important to you? Are you happy? And based upon that, you put this in a grid. Okay, I limit to from 5 to 5 just for readability here. But basically speaking, you can see from these interviews that there are mainly three zones. You know? The one when you deliver more than expected. This can be good, this can be bad. It depends the perspective, on the perspective. If you do more than expected, and they do not really value that this much, you're paying too much money or attention or effort to deliver something they don't really want. But it can be a differentiator. It can be this is why they like you more, because you're better. Okay? The central zone in there is where you're good. They are happy enough. The product is good enough. The service is good enough. Don't change. Don't touch. And then you have this. The not enough. This is where your innovation, this is where your effort should be put. This is where you suck. Sorry again. Oops, I'm breaking my contract. This is where you should do something. You can, of course, refine this a little bit by frequency, because it can be that I'm satisfied or dissatisfied, this is important or less important, but I just use it once in a year. And then you prioritize a little bit your effort. Okay? You can relate this, I'll go very quickly through this, to this scanner grid analysis. Have you seen that before? This is requirements engineering stuff. And you have this excitement factor. This is where you do more than expected. And people are excited because you're better. This is wow. But the problem with excitement factors is that as technology and time evolves, these excitement factors, these differentiators, everyone get them. You know? 30 years ago, having an ABS system, anti-breakage system, on a car was a luxury. Today, everyone has that. So you're moving from excitement factor to the basics. You know? Now we'll come to the value proposal. How do you propose value to your customers? And you have a certain client, certain customer, and these guys, they need to do something with what you deliver to them. They have a job. They have pain. There are things they hate about their job, like everyone. Things that doesn't go right. And they look for gain. They want to improve. They want to reduce the pain. Nobody likes the pain. Unless they are a little bit different psychologically speaking. Normally, nobody likes the pain. And the vendor, you have products and services. And hopefully, you can resolve their problem. If you don't solve a problem, don't try anything, because you're not interested in them. You have no interest to them. You're there to solve problems. You're there to help. This is what we deliver. Be smart. Make sure that you understand what you're delivering and what they want.
for God to ask the question, is it really what you want? How do you formulate a value proposal? A value proposal, and I'm, I'm, I'm telling this, and by the way, I have another presentation, not for now, because otherwise you will definitely skip lunch and then probably eat dinner as well. I just apply the same principle to us, testers. Because we as testers, independent of you know, the, the sector, the company we're working in, blah, 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 the kind of product that we're testing, whatever, we are also delivering services and products. We are delivering test results, we are delivering, you know, tester stuff, basically speaking. Okay? And you can apply the same routine to what we're delivering and see what is our added value, what is the kind of problems that we solve. Just, I heard yesterday uh, in, in uh, Wim's presentation, and I was, that was definitely interesting, don't be the sheep. If you attended that presentation, you understand what I'm talking about. I mean, don't fly blind. Do not just deliver stuff automatically, not understanding what you, exactly you're doing and what kind of problem you're solving. It's not because you produce a report and you say this is not good enough, la la la, that they will be interested in what you're saying. You deliver value to someone. And you need to seek for that value. You need to understand what kind of problem you're solving, to whom, and how you can improve that. And delivering a value proposal is for someone who is a jobber, who, who has a job to do, who is frustrated by some sort of pain. So you see where I'm going to. I want to solve a problem. Our solution, our service, our product, whatever it is, offers the capacity to solve the problem, unlike, this one is more optional, but this is when you really want to come to the, the deal, the selling point, unlike our competitors or others. Testers have a special value. We do things that no one else in the company is doing. We have a way to think, we have a way to act, we have products and services that we deliver that nobody else does. Even in these cross-functional teams when quality is everyone's business, la 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 la, we still have our added value. Now, one level up, the products and services that we are testing are solving problem. Which problem? Our customer's problem. And we need to make sure, and this is also our responsibility, I think, as, as testers in cross-functional teams, I think it is our responsibility to make sure that the problems that we're solving are the right problems. I want to juice my lemon in the morning. I don't want to speak with my wife because she's busy and she doesn't want to speak to me in the morning until she got free coffee and be here for. And it's, that is what it's all about. So this wonderful piece of art is completely useless for my job. I just want to have my lemon squeezed. Of course, we are testers and we need to tests our beliefs. We need to unbias. You know, this was a, a big preoccupation in the, the previous presentation as far as I recognize the world. Bias is something that is important that we need to fight against. So we believe we will solve with that product something, some problem somewhere. Okay? We need to assess that because this is our belief. And how do you assess that? By asking them by making surveys, by making sure that I'm coming three, three, four slides before, you need to check that you're serving your customers well, whoever they are, whatever the context. This presentation is uh, heavily inspired by this, this book from, from Jim Kalbach, uh, Jobs to be Done. Interesting method or methodology. There's no magic, you know? It's one method among the other. What I like is that it's value-centric and it's very easy to grab. So that's something that is pretty much portable, whether you're using the, uh, uh, how to say that, traditional way of testing or the brand new agile with an S, because there are so many uh, approaches, methodologies. I don't know what the child is uh, willing to be called today, uh, because there's some controversy in there. But whatever the context, this is applicable. That's about it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>